strike or send his family to the pier. And the strike fathers were known to uh, have torture. You know, they hung the ass out of wooden pincers, used up the food, the bones were dropped, uh, listen attentively and musically, knowing our lives each and every day. I think you love him so much that you would do that to strike me. Amen. We're in the book of Ephesians. We're going to start uh, verse 1. Uh, we did a bit of an introduction last week and uh, began slightly. Well, let's, let's, it might be a little bit of a review here. So starting in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in G Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, right here we get the idea, we know that uh, Paul is stating that he is the writer of this book, and he addresses it to, who does he address it to? I'm sorry. The saints at Ephesus. How does he describe, excuse me? The saints at Ephesus, right? Is that what you said? Okay. Are you trying to gaslight me? <laughs> well, I thought that's... Thank you. That's how they're described, and that's what I've asked for. So they're the saints, and they're faithful in Christ. That's how they're described. What's a saint? Basically, a saint is that. It's a follower of Christ, otherwise known as a Christian. It's saints are not something that are created or canonized or voted on by a group of people. There's no miracles involved in becoming a saint. There's many things that other uh, religious people believe uh, how you become a saint. So how do we become saints? Obeying the gospel, exactly. What does faithful mean? Excuse me? Continue to follow. Faithful. Can we be described as faithful? Basically, I, I would say, too, that faithful has to do, and we're going to see this word happen a lot in this first chapter, is trust. Trusting in God. Trusting in Christ. And what do we trust in? And we'll get into that if we having an answer at this time. What do we trust in? Why did we become Christians? We believed in the Word, and in the Word, we started to learn and grow that God makes promises to us through Christ, and we trust in those promises. So I'm laying a foundation here for things that we're looking at a little later on, okay? So, what does faithful mean? It has to do with the idea of, of trusting in God's promises. Let's take a look now at uh, verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the, <clears throat> there it is, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together to in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will. That we who are trusted, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, 
after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. It says here in verse 3, especially it carries through to, from verse 3 to verse 6, God has blessed us in every spiritual blessing. All spiritual blessings. Uh, we're going to take a look at something, if you don't mind. I have some scriptures. Let's, we'll start over here. Uh, would you look up Ephesians 1, 7, please? Ephesians 4, 3, Lori. Philippians 4, 7, Lou. Uh, 1 John 3, 22. Judy. Uh, Matthew 6, 33, 34. Romans 8, 28. Faith. Hebrews 2, 17 through 18. Hebrews 4, Tracy. 15 to 16. Teresa, Ephesians 1 and 11. Steve, 2 Timothy 4, 7 to 8. Paula, yeah, that's Paula. Second, uh, 1 Peter 1, 8 to 9. Uh, let's see what we got. 1 John 4, 7 to 8, please. Rose, Romans 5, 8. And Glenn, whatever you want to read. No, no, Romans 6, 23. <laughs> I figured he'd read what he wanted anyway. Spiritual blessings. What are spiritual blessings? Can you name some? I'm sorry, please. Peace of mind. That is a blessing, a spiritual blessing. Anything else? I'm sorry, Prayer. Prayer is definitely a spiritual blessing. Anyone else? Forgiveness, Forgiveness is a spiritual blessing. Peace. Peace. Did I give you that one? <laughs> Salvation is a spiritual blessing. Ephesians 1, 7. Would you read that for us, please? Forgiveness of sins is a spiritual blessing. Where would we be without forgiveness of sins? We'd be cut off from God, wouldn't we? We would not be recognized by him. In fact, he would keep us away from him. He doesn't want to be around those who are sinful. And the only way we can get back to that is through forgiveness of sins. And where do we find those forgiveness of sins? In Christ, all spiritual blessings. We're going to see that word in Christ, in him, in whom, at least 15 times here in the first chapter. Maybe less, maybe more, but about 15, I think I counted. In him, we find that. Lori, Ephesians 4, 3. Uh, Lou, would you read uh, uh, Philippians 4, 7? Didn't that, Philippians 4, 7? 4, 7? Peace. We're going to see this again in chapter 2, and then towards the end of chapter 1, there's peace. Christ brings peace. We find peace in Christ. What kind of peace do we have in Christ? There's more than one. Yeah, Glenn? Peace about our relationship with our God. Exactly. He brought peace between us and God. Christ did. He brought peace between you and me, between people. What other peace do we have? We have peace of mind because we trust in what the promise is, right? That's our hope. Uh, 
First John three twenty two. Is that you, Judy? Okay. First John three twenty two. Whatever we ask, that's a euphemism for what? Prayer. First uh, John five thirteen fourteen. Judy, is that right? What did that give you? Okay. Well, prayer is also found in. I must have skipped this one. Five thirteen through fourteen. When we ask, we have to ask in what? faith, that he will do that for us. Now, we ask, I mean, we don't ask for a million dollars, do we? But we ask for those things, and he knows what we need. So when we ask, we ask in faith, knowing that he will give. Why else do we pray for someone to be healed? Otherwise, it's a useless prayer. Why would we ask for people to have safe travels? Think about the things we ask for in prayer. And we expect God to answer it because we know that he will do that for his own, his children. We're going to see that again here in chapter 1. We are adopted children. Don't we give to our children what they ask for? And a lot of times we don't give because they don't need it. Matthew 6, 33-34. Thank you. And Romans 8, 28. Faye, did I give you that one? What blessing are we discussing here? Why worry? Why give care to something? God promises things to us. Why do we worry about what we're to wear, what we're to eat, where we're to to live? I mean, he does these things, he says, for the birds and the flowers and so forth. Worry about those things that need to be worried about. And what's the thing we need to be worried about? Nothing. That's it. Our relationship with God, which brings about our salvation. That's what we need to be worried about. We, not, you know, I won't say to the exclusion of other people, because we're going to see here in Ephesians, we are also to speak to others, teach others as well. But we are to worry about our own as well, ourselves. We can let that escape from us. We can become tied up in things of the world and forget about God and let that dwell on us more than anything else. And it happens from time to time. We all get caught up in it. And in so doing it, sometimes we find ourselves in a relationship that's not what it should be with God. So we have the blessing of care, care from God. Hebrews 2. Is that you, Drew? That's right. Uh, Tracy, would you read uh, uh, Hebrews 4, please? 15, 16. Jesus makes intercession with, for us to God because, that's not only his role, but because, It says here what we just read. He was human, and like us, he was tempted in all things. So we have someone who understands our frailties, someone that we can turn to when we need to in prayer 
for help, for strength in time of temptation. That's a spiritual blessing. We're all tempted. We don't all have the same temptations. Jesus knows what we're going through. All spiritual blessings are found in Christ. And help in time of temptation is one of them. Ephesians 1.11. Uh, uh, Teresa? I spelled it right. We have an inheritance. And we talked about that earlier, salvation and inheritance. We will receive things and receive it from him. 2 Timothy 4, 7 to 8. I don't know. Steve, is that you? Second. Yes, verses 7 and 8. That inheritance is eternal life. 1 Peter 1, 8, 9. We have joy in Christ. We can trust in his promises. We can trust in God's promises. We know what the outcome will be if we remain faithful. I mean, up to this point, won't we find joy in Christ because of the things that have been promised? 1 John 4, 7, 8, I don't remember who I gave that to. Romans 5, 8, I think then I gave that to you, Rose. Love is in Christ. He showed his love to us by going to the cross. God shows his love by sending Christ to be our sacrifice. Love is a blessing found in Christ. Romans six twenty three. And so that we've all sinned, we cannot approach God because of that, and Christ is the one that makes it possible, and through him we find our salvation. Comments or questions on spiritual blessings? And I know I have not covered them all by any means. Yeah, Glenn? Yeah, I, I was thinking that, but I wasn't going to say Eternal life. Yeah, I wasn't going to point it out. That's okay. Is there any other spiritual blessings that we have in Christ? Is there anything else? I know there's more than what I put up here, but I think that's enough to prove that we have an abundance. We are quite wealthy in spiritual blessings. If we were to take what, I mean, has anybody ever sat down and figured out what you're worth? I'm not worth a lot. Uh, we went to have a will made, and so they went and tried to figure out what we're worth. I had to pay her. So that made my worth even less. But anyway, as you do that, that's what they figure out to see what you have to leave. Well, like most people, we got a car, you know, we have a house, we got a few other things. And it seems like a lot. But compared to what other people have in this world, it's not a lot. But when I take a look on the spiritual side of what I have, I'm quite wealthy, and so are you. And sometimes we just have to stop and think sometimes what we have. I mean, what, what is it talked about? Count your blessings? I mean, we sing that song. Count your blessings. And when you start doing that, you find out you're quite wealthy 
in blessings through Christ. Anything else? Right. It would take a lot of trust to believe that's on that door. Mm-hmm. And part of our problem in dealing with the things of the world, the cares of the world, is the fact that we lose sight of the blessings that we have and that our trust is not what it's supposed to be. And he Paul points that out later on as we've read already that we trusted in things when we became Christ. That's what, I mean, when we became Christians. And many times that's why we became Christians. Because of what we realized we could gain. But the more we grow as Christians, we find it's more than just salvation that we have. We have all these others that are listed here. Anything else? Assurance. We can believe what he says. God is truthful. Christ is that assurance. Let's take a look at verses 3 and 4. Um, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Let me go ahead and do five as well. Having predestined us in adoption as sons of Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. says God has chosen. Later on, he uses the word predestined. Some of you have the word foreordained in the translation. These spiritual blessings that we are talking about were predestined, preplanned. And they were foreordained, predestined, or chosen by God, as it says, to be in Christ. This is God's plan that he set up, as we read, before the foundations of the world. So, the expression, in Christ, as I said, in him, by Christ Jesus, in the beloved, in whom and through his blood, is found 12 times in the verses 12 through 14, and uh, what we've already read. There is an obvious emphasis then here that God has chosen Christ to be be the means of these blessings that we've discussed. We've also looked at that God predestined before the earth was formed that Christ would be the source of all spiritual blessings. He also foreordained, foreordained or predestined the plan by which man could be redeemed. There is no blessing from God today that does not flow through Jesus Christ. I mean, these are the things that we're learning in these first few verses. Are there any material blessings or earthly blessings that we receive because we are children of God? Exactly. God blesses, turn over to Matthew 6, 25. The thing of it is, many of these blessings come to us not just as Christians, but to all people as well. Matthew 6, 25, 34, but he's speaking here to those who are following Jesus is. Um, I'm a little slow here today. Uh, am I in the right chat? Yeah, 6, 25. No one can uh, serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. 
Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you of not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one more cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Jesus is talking to God's children at that time, the Jews. But today, we are adopted. We are God's children. So this message to the children of God then is the message to the children of God now. And we've already talked about the cares of this world. God takes care of our cares. The things we worry about are trivial when it comes down to the eternal. And I think that's what God's trying to tell us here. We worry too much about the trivial sometimes, and God... We need to trust that God is taking care of that for us. So there are some blessings, I think, that are found as God's children, but there's also some that come just because we live here on earth. Matthew 5, 43, uh, 45, if you take a look at that. You have heard that it was said, you shall, uh, I'm going to, right, 43, 45. You have heard that it is said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you. And I'm in the wrong chapter, am I? Okay. And do good to them who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be of sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his, makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rains on the just and on the unjust. So as I said, there are things we received just because we're living here on earth, whether we are good or not, whether we are sons of God or not, children of God, I should say, or not. So this is another blessing of God that comes to everyone. But I believe the ones that Jesus was talking about come to us as adopted children of God. Comments or questions on this? I agree. Verse 3 talks about in heavenly places. Interesting enough, I found that it's the only, it's only found in the book of Ephesus in heavenly places. Uh, verse 1, 3, let's take a look at these. In him we have uh, redemption, I'm sorry, I'm in verse 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Let's uh, turn over to uh, verse 20 in chapter 1. I'm slow in getting there today, aren't I? Okay. Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. I'm going to ask a question, so be ready, okay? Second uh, Ephesians, Ephesians 2 and 6. Uh, I think 
guess the print's getting too small for me. There it is. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 10. I think I'd find it. If you find it for me, I don't mind somebody reading. Here it is. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. And in the last one, let's turn to chapter 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Heavenly places. How would you define that? In some of these, it's a reference to what? Heavenly places. It's a reference to what? Okay, so that has to be it has to be the place of God, so heaven. But we, the last one we read, it talks about the principality powers of darkness. Who's that a reference to? The devil, Satan. Is he in heaven? So in heavenly places must re, must be a reference to something that is. We can't see it, right? So what's that? If you can't see it, it's either. It's either physical or it's spiritual. So if we can't see it, it's spiritual. So it's a spiritual place, but it's not heaven. So in heavenly places, we have to be careful. It's not always a reference to heaven, but to a place that is spiritual, a spiritual realm. So the reference to this spiritual place then, it's not earthly. It's not material. And it's not just the dwelling place of, of God, as we read in, in ver, uh, chapter 6 of verse 12. So it is spiritual by nature. Comments, questions at any time, you can stop me. Let's look at, uh, if not, then we'll move on to uh, verse 4. Verse three. Sure. And believe it or not, we're going to see that link later on in chapter 2 about how Jesus has done that for heaven and earth. He unites the two, and that's through what you've just said. A little more than that, too, but what you've just said, yes. God chose us. This is kind of, for some people, it's difficult. It, it almost leads to uh, the, how Calvinism is the word I was looking for, how Calvinism came about. Believing that God has chosen specific individuals to be saved. He predestined you. Even though you're baptized, you're not saved. God chose who's going to be saved, but you're, you've gone ahead and done what he's asked to do. How is that fair? Uh, remember the, the uh, acronym TULIP for Calvinism? I had to write it down because I forget it. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. Of these two, these kind of apply here. You know, limited atonement, it's only for a few. Irresistible grace, I'm saved even if I don't do anything. Now, how does that meet up, mesh, with what we read elsewhere in the Bible? So they've taken just this part and misunderstood it. So the question is, what's been predestined? That's it. If you're a Christian, he then predestined not individuals, specific individuals. He predestined a group of individuals. 
And that group of individuals is Christians, those in Christ. He predestined then in Christ, is how it says. Uh, verse 4. And I've lost it again. Just as he chose us in him, in him, in Christ, he chose us, us individuals, no, us as Christians in Christ. Christ is the one. Christ is the plan. That's what's been predestined. Before the foundation of the world, this word foundation comes up a lot in the first three chapters of, of uh Ephesians. A foundation is what we build on, and this is what he set up before the foundation of the world, before the world ever began, before the cosmos. Oop, did I go backwards? God's plan. We've already read God's plan. All spiritual blessings are in Jesus Christ. That's his plan. Jesus Christ. Verse 4, God's scheme of redemption. Think about it. It's not an accident. He thought this up. Not as history unfolded, but he thought this up before history. What else did he predestine or foreordain? How we were to become holy without blame. Scheme of redemption. Verse 5, and we've read this. He predestined by the means of a, that we were to be adopted. We are adopted sons and daughters. We are adopted in the family of God through Christ. God made us accepted to him, verse 6, through Christ. Death, burial, resurrection, his means for salvation. All of this was determined before the world began. This was his plan in his mind. The church. Now, whether we accept or not, now he's, he gets a little bit into this a little later on, if it's in chapter 1 and especially in chapter 2. Whether or not we accept all these is determined on the condition of faith. And we've mentioned quite a bit about faith already. In Ephesians 2 and, and 8, um, we will look at that hopefully next week. But... Uh, Mark, do you have that? Would you read it? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. It's for everyone. Titus 2, 11, 12. Everyone has the opportunity to receive this gift, but there is, and we're going to be looking at this again in Ephesians and we read about it last week, if you think about it, when Paul was in prison, he stayed in a house and he called the, the, uh, the Jewish elders to him to talk to them. And they said, we want to hear some more from you. And he preached to them, he taught them. And what happened? Some wanted to hear more, others rejected him. Free will. It's for everyone, but not everyone is going to accept it. So belief versus unbelief will separate the saved from the lost, John 3 and 35. Again, this is God's plan, but it's for us to either to accept or reject. In Romans 6, 16, God forces none to obey him. It's an individual choice we make. It's not a group choice, and we should not feel pressured to make that choice. So God's plan, predestined, that's what's been predestined. And it's been predestined through Christ. All of this before anything ever happened. 
as far as creation. Comments, questions? So the predestined are a group of people, Christians, not individuals. So the predestined are those who accept Christ through the conditions that have been set forth by him and the apostles. Jesus set it out. The apostles taught it, proclaimed it. And we're going to see that the apostles helped to lay this foundation of which Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Chapter 2. Those who are predestined for salvation, Christians, as we said. So, what do we know? Acts 10 and 34. This would preclude all of this, saying, no, that's not right. God is no respecter of persons in the King James. God shows no partiality, New King James. In another translation, God shows no favoritism. So he's not picking out you, 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 you. It's us that has to do. And I know we've been taught this before. Verse 7 says, yes. Also, if you think about <coughs> God doesn't force us to believe. It's our free, it's our free will. Right. And we can choose. We have that right to choose to follow him or not follow him. And if you think about the predestination doctrine, you don't have a choice. No. You're selected and that's it. Well, you know? that's... Uh, uh, Limited atonement, is that right? Have no, uh, no chance of um, saying no if that's what you want. You go out and live your life the way you want to because you're going to be saved no matter what. But you don't know that. Doesn't hold. Doesn't hold. Verse 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood. What's redemption mean? What does the word redeem mean? When we redeem something, go ahead and take a coupon and redeem it. Or we redeem something like you pawn it and redeem it. It has the idea of buying. In this case, buying back. Jesus bought us back. Back to whom? Who we bought back to? God. We were cut off from God. Why? Sin. Sin cuts us off. Jesus brings us back through his blood. So redemption means to buy back. That's why Jesus is our redeemer. We have redemption through his blood. We separate ourselves from God through our sins, Romans uh, 3 and 23. And God predestined that through Jesus, we could be brought back to him, to be back in fellowship with God, to be like the relationship he had with uh, Adam and Eve, before they, they're sinned. So, through the blood of Christ, the, the, the penalty for, for sin has been paid. Anything I've left out there? Take a look at verse 8. Uh, 11, 7, 8. which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his, am I reading the right one? Yeah. Uh, mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. <clears throat> oh, I, I should have read 9 as well. I did read 9. Okay. Let me go back and reread that, okay? 
Let's start at verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth to him, which is something that, that Glenn met, mentioned earlier. All right. God has made known to us the mystery of his will, verse 9. What's a mystery? Go ahead. That's our cliffhanger for next week. What's a mystery? <laughs> 